for coming to host the coffee hour beforehand and just in being able to speak with John this morning and some of the other veterans has given the thought of maybe of doing another program with John where people will bring in photographs and we can have a much more interactive program. So I look forward to working that out with John uh, after this program today. But let us go ahead. I have to tell you, I was not familiar with Jack Craig. I had not heard his name but his reputation precedes him through so many of you who have seen him in other communities. And I'll tell you, people travel from town to town to see him and his vast number of programs. But what could be more appropriate today than to do a salute to our veterans? So I'm going to let Jack tell you a little bit about his background, and let's start the program. Ladies and gentlemen, Jack Craig. Good morning. Good morning. I have a built-in sound system. How's it working? Good. If at any point you cannot hear me, just point your finger to the ceiling and I'll be glad to turn up the volume for you a little bit. If I'm obsessively loud, point this way and I'll turn it down a little bit. I'm proud to be with you and I want to start with a couple of, I call them public service announcements. First, a thank you to Julie. Um, for inviting me to be with you this morning. I'm proud to come out and be with you. I, I know this area reasonably well for different reasons, and I'm not going to go into those now, but it's fun um, to come out to Wayland for me this morning. The second thing I'm going to tell you before we begin is um, I have a wide range of programming. I present programmings for a wide range of organizations, but all my programmings go under one heading, eight. A-P-E, and that's an acronym for Audience Participation Event. <laughs> so I'm making a big deal about it because this is not a concert. This is an Audience Participation Event. For the songs that are in the program this morning, you're invited to be singing along. I cannot require you to do that, but I'm always going to tell a group the same thing. I accept singing by any definition you want to give it. <laughs> so whatever happens when one opens one's mouth is absolutely okay for the program this morning. Now it's time for us to get to work. I was pleased when Julie selected this program because we know Veterans Day sits on the horizon coming up on Sunday. And um, for this program, I like to broaden the scope of the uh, interaction, let's say, between music and the concept of Veterans Day. And I'll explain what I mean by that as we get going, but I'd like us to start off today with a wonderfully simple song. If you open your booklet and look at song number one, Reverend Samuel Smith in 1831 provided the lyrics for this song, America, so about 400 elementary age school children could premiere it on the steps of the Park Street Church in Boston, Massachusetts. So it's wonderfully easy to sing because he knew he was getting a song together for young school children to sing. I love it in its simplicity, but after we sing it, I'll show it how it helps me zero in on the concept of Veterans Day. So in your book, it's number one. My country is a peace, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. And where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Our fathers loved to thee, Father. Thank you. 
So I like pointing out three things about that song. Number one, the lyrics are very clear, land where my fathers died. So in 1831, that would be a reference to prior conflicts before 1831. I think most of us know, I think it was not too long ago that the last veteran from World War I passed. That was, I think, within the last year and a half or so. Um, so for as far as our records are concerned, there now are no longer living veterans from World War I. It would be the subsequent conflicts coming forward. We still have somewhere in the range of 23 million veterans. Uh, that number is ever changing um, for two reasons. Obviously, some pass, but others are now serving. And so the number will go up and down over the course of time. But I like extending the concept back earlier in time so that land where my fathers died in 1831, referencing earlier conflict. And then the key word for me uh, for Veterans Day is freedom. Because when I reduce my thinking about Veterans Day to an ultimate simplicity, I was a school teacher for 35 years. And I found the best way to get kids to learn something was to make it simple. So when it comes to Veterans Day, I see the word veteran and I immediately put the word freedom beside it. And, and in between, I put the phrase, veterans are defenders of our freedom. And there's no greater privilege for us who are here today than our freedom. I mean, let's be honest, it's coincidental that I'm here the day after a national election. But we got to exercise a freedom yesterday that some people in other places around the world would yearn to have. So that's just one of the freedoms that's defended by the service of our valiant veterans. So I take us back now with song number two. Yankee Doodle, you know under that title, but that was not its original name. Yankee Doodle originated in England under the title Nanky Doodle. And it was a very derisive song. It was the upper crust of Britain thumbing their nose at the Puritans. Now, essentially, without going into a history lesson, those Puritans, some of them, were the ones that came here and kind of got us going. That's why I think it's important to go back to this piece. But there's an interesting side story. The song Nanky Doodle, derisive, um, basically calling Puritans dimwits. I'm very glad those dimwits came over here. Um, but the dimwits um, came here, and when they came, they didn't have much time for music. So they weren't writing songs, we weren't composing, we weren't writing songs with lyrics. We kind of brought songs along with us from England when we came. During the French and Indian War, a Dr. William Shackberg knew the song Nanky Doodle, and he heard Native Americans struggling to say the word English. And when they tried to say it, it would come out, Yangis, Yangis, Yangis. And from that, he heard Yankee. So he changed Nanky Doodle to be Yankee Doodle. Now, I get to our first significant conflict that would have given us veterans, although we didn't use the term then, and that would be our war for our freedom, the Revolutionary War, against the Brits. So now we're fighting the Brits, and at the end of the war, when General Cornwallis had to surrender his sword ceremonially to General Washington, guess which song General Washington had played? Yankee Doodle. And what was he choosing it for? Because now we whooped them, so it was us doing this to the Brits. <laughs> so the song went full circle from being anti-Puritan to being used at the end of the conflict. It's wonderfully cute. There's lots of verses. Here we go. The Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat to call the Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle, and behind the music. 
music on the step and with the girls behind me. And now I look at some of you fellas with a little wink and a nod. What's that line about, and with the girls be handy? How does that connect to servicemen during the Revolutionary War, or any other time, for that matter of fact? Don't get me started, because I could digress on that topic for a little bit. Um, as you look at song number three, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and song number four coming after it, bring us up to the Civil War. I found it profoundly sad, and I'm just going to say it quickly, but quite frankly, the largest loss of American life ever in any conflict was in the Civil War. And we were fighting ourselves. Mm -hmm. So 600,000 American souls were lost in that horrible era in our history. So I'm not taking sides. I'm not here to give a history lesson. I'm just going to say there were songs celebrating both the North and the South. You probably remember, I wish I was in the land of and this first song celebrated the North. The Battle Hymn of the Republic came in 1862. And by the way, for the first few songs here, My Country, Tis of Thee, and this one, I don't think we had figured out separation of church and state yet. Isn't it interesting? You could have beautiful old songs that would have references to things religious, and it didn't matter. They could be right in the middle of a patriotic song. I wish we'd do away with some of the political correctness that we seem to be caught up with, but that's only my opinion. Julia Ward Howe was riding in a buckboard in Washington, D.C., and Union soldiers would come back in from the front during the Civil War to get a little break, and a lot of them would head straight to the tavern. I don't know what that says about men who were serving during that time, but that's where they went. So Julia Ward Howe was riding in a buckboard with the then governor of Massachusetts, Governor Andrews, and she was also in the presence of a minister, a Reverend John Francis Clark. And when they went past a tavern, I'll give you a little, I'll give you a little demonstration here. When they went past a tavern, uh, this is what they witnessed. John Brown's body lies a molding in the grave. John Brown's body lies a molding in the grave. That soldier had had a few too many beverages. And he was singing another version of this song. And it, it existed as a camp meeting song first. Then it got the John Brown's body version. And Reverend Clark in the buckboard turned to Julia Howe and says, do you suppose you could write a more suitable lyric for that song? And she wrote it as the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And it became one of the dynamic songs of the late 1800s. Going back to that separation of church and state thing, guess where the first place was that I learned this song? in church. It was in hymnals. It was in church hymnals. It became profoundly respected, actually, even though it has that connection to conflict. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trapping up the vintage where the grapes of wrath were stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of this terrible swift sword. His truth is marching. were different, but isn't it something to think about in that second verse? He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Just a different way of thinking of the profound impact that one's service might have during any one of these times that we're talking about. Now, our next song came at the very end of the Civil War. It was the celebration song at a peace celebration in New Orleans where 
President Lincoln commissioned Louis Lambert, and I need to tell you, under this title, when Johnny comes marching home, that's not a real person. Louis Lambert was actually Patrick Sarsfield Gilmore. He was from Boston, Massachusetts. He was the band director for the whole Union Army during the Civil War. President Lincoln commissioned him to write a song that would be neutral, that could be sung at the end of the Civil War. So yes, maybe Johnny was a Union soldier, or maybe Johnny was a Confederate soldier. It didn't matter. At the end of that conflict, anybody was just glad if they were going home. I already referenced the loss of life from the Civil War. So Gilmore, very famous, he had a band in Boston called Gilmore's Band. They played the first ever concert on the Esplanade in Boston. So anytime you watch a July 4th program and you see the Boston Pops on the Esplanade, if Gilmore's band didn't kind of start that tradition, we might not have the Pops continuing it to this day. A little bit of When Johnny Comes Marching Home. When Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah, hurrah, we'll give him a hearty welcome and hurrah, hurrah, the men will cheer, the boys will shout, the ladies, they will all turn out and we'll all feel gay. Marching home, get ready for the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah! We'll give them a hero three times three. Hurrah, hurrah! The laurel wreath is ready now to place upon his loyal brow. We'll all feel king when Johnny comes marching home. As you look at Yankee Doodle Boy, isn't it interesting how some of the concepts get carried through? From the Revolutionary War, we get Yankee Doodle. Now, George M. Cohan, who's the celebratory person in the next part of the program, picks up on that concept, and we are now called Yankees, proudly, still to this day. Has nothing to do with the baseball team. Has everything to do with being from the United States. And in, in uh, 1904, Cohan was writing and directing and producing his own shows. And uh, he wrote a show called Little Johnny Jones, and in it, he put the song Yankee Doodle Boy. And I'm going to just fast forward really quickly. I'll get to it a little bit later in the program, uh, but in case I forget, remember during World War II, a movie was made about George M. Cohan, and Jimmy Cagney was its star. And you got to hear all of these Cohan songs smack dab in the middle of World War II when Cagney was playing Cohan in the movie Yankee Doodle Dandy. So that was the name of the movie. This was the song that it was based on. I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy, the Yankee Doodle Do or Die. A real life nephew of my uncle Sam's, born on the 4th of July. I've got a Yankee Doodle sweetheart. She's my Yankee Doodle Joy. Yankee Doodle went to London just to ride the ponies. I am a Yankee Doodle boy. In 1906, Cohan was uh, wealthy. His parents and his sister and he had been the highest paid vaudeville act in the late 1800s. And he was able to own one of those new things, a kind of square thing with four round things on the bottom and an engine that went putt, 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 putt. In 1906, they called them automobiles. We've shortened it to cars, I think. So he had an automobile, and he was proud. And Cohen would drive down the dirt streets of New York City in 1906, and he'd go putt, 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 putt. And one night, he pulled up alongside a fellow that you and I, in modern terms, would probably call a homeless man. And uh, he was bedraggled, scruffy, had a knapsack. And Cohen looked at him and said, you want to ride in my automobile? And the man looked at him skeptically, then he looked down the street, and the old man said, well, I do have to get down the road a piece. Maybe I'll take a chance. Getting in a car was taking a chance. <laughs> Goes around, and when he gets in, Cohan sees an old, tattered, torn American flag sticking out of the man's rucksack. Cohan looks at him and kind of derisively says, what are you keeping that old flag for? Throw it away and get a new one. And the man indignantly turned to Cohan and said, That, sir, is my prized possession. I was the flag bearer at Pickett's charge at the Battle of Gettysburg. 
So in fact, unknowingly, Cohen had picked up a veteran, a veteran from the Civil War that had run in front of the soldiers, as you see it depicted with the flag, at the Battle of a Pickett's Charge. And so the old man was going to keep that flag. If he didn't keep any other possession, he was going to keep that flag. I would imagine perhaps veterans have a few prized possessions that they've kept just as a, a way of remembering their service to the country. That inspired Cohen to write a song that he initially titled, You're a Grand Old Rag. When he first performed at the Critics Rifle, and remember, Cohen was famous at this time. They rifled him for referring to the American flag as a rag, but they didn't know the story about the old man in the car, you see. So Cohen was honoring the man for the Pickett's Charge flag bearing, and then he quickly had to change it to flag because there was such an outcry, actually. So um, in your booklet, it's number six that we're up to now. You're a grand old flag, you're a high flag. the next segment now, we continue with another Cohen song, but we notch up to World War I. Uh, I do a whole separate program on the songs of World War I. The music of World War I is fascinating, but there's no better representative of the music of World War I than over there. Cohen was no longer performing. He was kind of semi-retired, and he wrote over there the day after President Wilson declared our involvement in World War I. It became kind of one of the pinnacle hits. There were hundreds of songs crafted during World War I, and the music of World War I was where the debate about the war took place. I'm not going to digress on that, but there were songs during World War I like, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier, followed immediately by another song, I'm proud to be the mother of a soldier. So the debate about whether we should or should not be in World War I was carried out in part through song. This, however, very spirited, got translated into French, sung by Enrique Caruso and other noted performers at the time. Our allies from World War I loved this song. Here we go. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me, every son of liberty. Hurry right away, no delay, go today. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to pine, to be proud of her boys in line. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there. Let the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums tum tumming everywhere. So prepare, say a prayer, send the word, send the word to beware. We'll be longer, we're coming longer, and we won't come back till it's over, over there. Specific question. Are there any women veterans in the room this morning? Women veterans. Thank you. Thank you. Now, notice, they hadn't figured out in World War I that women could do that yet. So we got that part about, make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to be proud, to be proud her boys in line. Women did help mightily during World War I, but it was with the Red Cross, it was with shipmaking and shipbuilding in the harbors of Boston and elsewhere. So they helped mightily, but they weren't yet given the ability to actually be part of active duty military. Wow, have times changed. Have times changed. We have women who are combat aircraft pilots now flying uh, with our services. As you um, come to the next segment of the program, and I, I know I've happily just recognized women who serve, how about hands from all the veterans in the room? Thank you for your service. Thank you. See, 
I knew I was going to get at least one hand because when I came into the parking lot, I parked near a vehicle that had this red thing on the side that said Semper Fi. <laughs> I think there might be a Marine in the room, but I'm not 100% sure on it. But I don't want to get in any trouble. I want to be very clear, I did not serve, and I'm not showing any preference in the next part of the program to any branch of the service. I'm playing the part of a music historian, and we're going to do the five major military branch songs in the order that they were created historically. So I didn't put the Marines first for any specific reason. It's just their song came first. That was the Marines hymn. It was wonderfully historical. So people, when they sang it, some people didn't even know that the halls of Montezuma was a reference to the Mexican-American war that we fought in. And the shores of Tripoli was fighting pirates off the Barbary Coast, which our Marines did. Isn't it strange? that we fought pirates hundreds of years ago and we're still dealing with them today. In 2012, it's just something for us to think about. So wonderfully historical, the Marines. The Quezon Song is no longer called the Quezon Song. It is, or I should say, under that title, it was the Song of the Army. Today it's called The Army Goes Rolling Along. The answer to that is simple. A Quezon was a wagon drawn by animals that the army moved their heavy stuff in. And this song was written over in the Philippines where there were hills and dales and dusty trails, and the caissons went rolling along. Well, in the modern era, we've got machinery that moves that stuff. So we don't need the horse-drawn wagons anymore, so it's called the army goes rolling along. It has been taught that way ever since the 1960s to those in the army. Now, I keep it in its old historical version. <laughs> The third song, number 10, Anchors Away, representing the Navy. And um, the Navy song is kind of a little bit humorous because Zimmy, this uh, Charles Zimmerman on the right-hand side there, was the bandmaster at the Naval Academy. And he wrote the music initially as a pep song for the Army-Navy football game. So that's where the music came from. And then a retired Navy man, Alfred Miles, put lyrics to it that officialized it as the Navy song in 1926. I'm just curious, any Coast Guardsmen or Coast Guards women in the room? <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. I'm celebrating you singly because so many times around New England I get no hands for the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard should not be forgotten where I live in Marshfield, Massachusetts. We still have one of the towers that was used to watch the coast and keep our coastline safe and we forever have had a wonderful concept of coast guarding in this country. Um, uh, so in Alaska in 1927, Francis Van Buskirk had a detachment of coast guardsmen uh, protecting our coast in the 27 year in Alaska. Imagine serving in Alaska in the winter. Ooh! I was cold this morning when I got in my car. That would have been really cold serving up there. Tough duty, you see. And he wanted to pick up the spirits of his fellow mates, so he wrote Semper Paratus, the song of the Coast Guard. And lastly, for you, Air Corps, and I say that first because the Air Force began as the U.S. Army Air Corps, and some served in that way. And then, when we rapidly developed so many planes for World War II, we split it off and it became its own branch, referred then as the Air Force. So they said, hey, wait a minute. Those other four branches, they've got songs. We should have a song. So the Air Force song was the result of a national songwriting contest with a cash prize for the winner whose song was chosen to be the Air Force song, which came in 1939, so the last of the five songs. Now that I've mentioned them, we're going to do them as a medley. If you can remember, if you can remember, as we do them as a medley, which means we won't stop in between them, we'll just kind of keep going. If you are a veteran from any of the branches that we're singing, if while we're singing that song you could either stand or just raise your hand, I'd like to get a feeling. So if you're a Marine, your hand's going up with this first one. If you're Army, your hand's going up with the second. If you're Navy, the third one. If you're Coast Guard, the fourth one. And if you're Air Force, the final one. Just to show us the veterans in the room. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Where's that Marine? Yeah. We will find our country's battle in the air on land and sea. First to fight for right and freedom and to keep our honor clean. We are proud to claim the title of the United States Marines. Army! Over hill, over dale, we will hit the dusty trail. Go rolling along. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it's so in interesting, uh, you know, to see the the different configuration of hands that are raised with various audiences that I'm with. Uh, and I always like to have a little fun um, in the program, too. So how come the Navy song had that part about drink to the foam? <laughs> but remember, remember, John Brown's body lies a moldy in the grave. I have to be honest. If I had served, I probably would have had a beverage or two along the way. I don't know. I just, I just feel compelled to say that. I think. Um, during World War I, Irving Berlin served in World War I. He was in the Army stationed at Camp Upton out on Long Island. And we're going to do two songs that uh, arrived during World War I from the pen of Irving Berlin. However, this first one that we're going to do, God Bless America, didn't really see the light of day until 1938. In World War I, Irving Berlin wrote it in 1917 to be used in a show called Yip Yip Yap Hank. He did not include it in the show. Instead, it went back into the drawer of his desk. In 1938, his telephone rang, and on the other end was Kate Smith, one of his buddies. She said, Irving, that's what she called Irving Berlin, Irving, I'm singing in an Armistice Day radio program. Have you got a good patriotic tune for me? So I want to stop and make one thing clear. I hope many of us know that on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, meaning November 11th, at 11 a.m. in 1918, the Armistice was signed that ended World War I. That's why we had Armistice Day celebrations, but in the late 30s, Congress changed that to be Veterans Day. So the reason why we need to hold on to that 11-11, that November 11th date, is really important, I think, because it came from a very significant event from World War I. So when Kate says, give me a good patriotic tune, the next day, Irving Berlin arrives at her apartment and hands her God Bless America. She says, wow. This guy must be a genius. <laughs> Stayed up all night and wrote me this song. What she didn't know is it probably took him an hour or two to find it in the drawer of his desk. And he somehow had remembered it and said, oh, well, I guess I'll give it to her. And ever since Kate Smith performed it, we've been enjoying it ever since. Now, in his handwritten instructions on the original manuscript for God Bless America, Irving Berlin wrote, to be performed like a hymn, H-Y-M-N. He wanted it to be solemn. And Irving Berlin lived to be 101 years of age. Oh my gosh, I bet he hated some of the versions that you hear at the ballparks at the seventh <laughs> inning stretch. Some people get way too carried away with God Bless America. I'm going to keep it the way he intended. <laughs> While the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be grateful for a land so fair as we raise our voices in a solemn prayer. City to serve in World War II. She would get up on a little platform, and before ships would depart, she would sing God Bless America. She did that for free. She just would go down there. If she knew a ship were departing, 
and she'd do it, and she'd do it as often as she could. And so many servicemen and women had that treat. Ironically, during World War II, so much attention was being paid to the needs of the war, etc., etc. Not many patriotic songs were written, but one was written during World War II. It came because a band leader, you might remember the name of a swing band leader, Fred Waring. Yeah. Okay. Fred Waring had a radio program, and he invited a local high school glee club to come and sing on his radio program. And um, he asked Don Ray and Al Jacobs, two of his buddies, to write a patriotic song the kids could sing on the radio program. And the song he got back was, This Is My Country. This is my country. time of World War II, there was a marvelous sharing of songs. And the next two songs represent that fact. We had songs that our servicemen and women heard in England and France and elsewhere. And the songs came here and became popular. And number 15 is an example of that. Ross Parker and Charlie Hughes were British songwriters. And they wrote, We'll Meet Again. And if you liked it here, people thought they could connect it to the fact if someone was serving, they were going away, and the song was hopeful that we'll meet again, that that person will come back. So it worked. But I have to tell you, in England, the profound use of it was during the time of what were called evacuation ships. The pending damage was going to be so severe in England from the bombing of German bomber pilots that they evacuated children trying to protect the next generation of British people. So ships came into their ports, and children only left on the ships. Every inch of space being used for children, parents did not go with them. And I have chatted with children who are now adults who were evacuated from England and remember their parents holding their hand walking down the street onto the dock to put their children on the ship, singing this song to them. Kent went to the movie theater here in the United States. They were Americans. Neither of them had ever been to England. They saw a newsreel telling how German bomber pilots would line up the nose of their aircraft on the white cliffs of Dover and fly inland to drop their bombs on London. So the white cliffs, unfortunately, were a marker for the German bomber pilots coming across the channel. So Burton and Kent, when they saw that newsreel in the movie theater, and by the way, some people went to the theaters more to see the newsreels in the early years of the war than to see the movies. It was about the only way you could learn anything that might be going on during World War II. We didn't have the instant news media that we have now. I'm still trying to decide. I don't think it's a great idea to have newsmen and cameras going with troops into Iraq. That's the way I felt. We were getting that instant information 
I, I don't want to digress on that, but I, I'm just mentioning it because, boy, have times changed. Mm -hmm. So people would see this newsreel like Burton and Kent, they felt so badly for our British allies, they wrote this song, painting a much prettier picture over the white cliffs of Dover. And as soon as it hopped across the pond, a great British songstress by the name of Vera Lynn started to perform it. And she sang at the Allied air bases outside of London. She was called the Sweetheart of the Forces. She made it famous there. Kate Smith made it famous here. We loved it. There be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover. Tomorrow, just you wait and see. There'll be love and laughter and peace ever after. Tomorrow, when the world is free, the shepherd will tend his sheep. The valley will bloom again, and Jimmy will go to sleep in his own little room again. There'll be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Clover. Tomorrow, just you wait and see. Now, in World War One in that show, Yip, Yip, Yap, Hank, that Irving Berlin wrote, he did use, Oh, How I Hate to Get Up in the Morning. By the way, I'll smile and tell you, the lyrics of this song work for me every day of the week. <laughs> in about five years, we're going to celebrate the 100th anniversary of this song. I've already decided how I'm going to celebrate. I'm sleeping in. I'm sleeping in. Now, Irving Berlin um, used it in World War I, and then during World War II, Irving Berlin went, made one of the most quiet, philanthropic donations to the wartime effort that people didn't know about. He went to the government and he said, during World War I, I wrote a show. We raised a lot of money for the Army Emergency Relief Fund. I want to write another show during World War II, and he did. He called his show, This is the Army. You probably know the song, This is the Army, Mr. Jones, okay? Now, he also used this song again in World War II, Oh, How I Hate to Get Up in the Morning. And Irving Berlin himself was in the show. But getting back to that philanthropic generosity, Irving Berlin paid for every penny of this show out of his own pocket. A cast and crew of 150 took the show around the United States for 28 weeks. Then they took it to Australia. Then they took it to England. Then they took it to the major allied bases, not small bases, but safe, large allied bases, and performed it. Irving Berlin paid for every bit of that out of his own pocket. Think about it. Take 150 of your friends with you next week and travel around the United States, and you put them up in hotels, and you buy their meals, and you buy their plane tickets. You better have a pretty good line of credit on your credit card, I'll tell you. I don't know how Irving Berlin paid, because they didn't have credit cards when he was doing this. So it was an amazing contribution. He himself sang this. Between now and Sunday, if you keep your eye peeled on PBS, you'll see probably some footage of Irving Berlin sings. It's always played around the time of Veterans Day. The other day I chanced to meet a soldier friend of mine. He'd been in camp for several weeks and he was looking fine. His muscles had developed and his cheeks were rosy red. I asked him how he liked the life and this is what he said. Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Oh, how I love to remain in bed. Oh, the hardest blow of all is to hear the bugle call. You gotta get up, you gotta get up, you gotta get up this morning. Someday I'm going to murder the bugler. Someday they're going to find him dead. I'll amputate his rapidly and step upon him happily and spend the rest of my life to bed. <laughs> there were other verses that were pretty funny, too. If I were telling you the story of Irving Berlin, I would remind you that he never went to school beyond the third grade. What a good mind he had, though. How about I'll amputate his reveille and step upon it heavily and spend the rest of my life in bed. I'll try an experiment. If I say the title Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy, what singing group are you thinking of? Andrew Sisters. It never fails. It never fails. So in 1941, um, 
uh, they began performing this song. Um, it got used in a movie that they were in. But more importantly, it's a wonderful song. Some people tell me they were so busy doing the Lindy or the Jitterbug to this song, they never paid attention to the words. But the words were important because they told another musical facet of World War II. Uh, literally, 50% of almost any trade group was drafted for service during World War II. So I'm not leaving out bankers or grocery clerks or gas station attendants. They got drafted. But in 1939, there were 8,000 swing bands active in the United States. 50% of every swing band got drafted into World War II. They were the prime age kind of fellas, particularly, to be serving. There were a few all-girl bands at the same time. But a lot of folks got drafted. Now, if you were in Boston, that wouldn't be a problem. Because if your dance band had 25 people and 12 of them got drafted, there were a lot of other dance bands in Boston. So other musicians could regroup and they could keep a band going. But if you were in Iowa and you had the only dance band for 150 miles and 50% of them got drafted, that dance band was gone. So by the end of World War II, 8,000 swing bands reduced to fewer than 2,000 swing bands. That was one of the secondary impacts of World War II. People say, why did swing band music kind of disappear so suddenly in the middle of the 1940s? The answer is actually pretty obvious. So um, when we sing this song, you can tap your feet if you've never sung it. It kind of makes you do that. I'm going to give you a break. I'll do it a little slower than the Andrew Sisters. But what the words are telling you is that story that I just told you. The trumpet man was famous because he was a dance band musician. But he got drafted. His number came up and he was gone with the draft. He's in the army now, blowing reveille. He's the boogie woogie bugle boy of Company B. <laughs> he was a famous trumpet man from out Chicago way. He had a boogie style that no one else could play. He was the top man of his craft. But then his number came up and he was gone with the draft. He's in the army now, a blowing reveille. He's a boogie woogie bugle boy from Company B. He made him blow a bugle for his Uncle Sam. It really brought him down because he couldn't jam. The captain seemed to understand. Because the next day the cap went out and drafted a band. And now the company jumps when he plays Reveille. He's the boogie woogie bugle boy from Company B. A toot, a toot, a tootle yaddy toot. He blows it into the bar. In boogie rhythm, he can't blow a note unless the bass and guitar is swaying with him. He makes the company jump when he plays Reveille. He's the boogie woogie bugle boy from Company B. You did a good job keeping up. Frank Lesser was another musician slash veteran. In the middle of the 30s, you knew Frank Lesser songs, even if you didn't know his name, songs like Two Sleepy People, Here We Are, Out of Cigarettes, Holding Hands and Longing, Look How Late It Gets. He served in the Special Forces Division during World War II. He heard a story come over the airwaves from Pearl Harbor, a true story about a Lieutenant Howell Forgey, the chaplain on the USS New Orleans in Pearl Harbor. When the attack took place on Pearl Harbor, chaplains, I don't know if you know this, but chaplains in the service were not allowed to shoot guns or throw hand grenades. It was one of the facets of their service. They were to be chaplains. Um, and so their job in the attack on Pearl Harbor, Lieutenant Forgey's job was to pass ammunition boxes up to the gunners on the rails of the battleship, you see. So he was going along and he was passing his boxes of ammunition, true story. And he'd come to the next gunner on the deck and the gunner would look down at him and say, Chaplain, pray for me. Because the people up on the rails knew how the battle was going fiercely, unfortunately, one way, the wrong way in Pearl Harbor. So what Lieutenant Forgey would do is he'd put the box of ammunition up and then he'd go like this, praise the Lord, and then he'd pass the next box of ammunition, praise the Lord, and then he'd pass the next, all he had time for, the battle was so fierce, his prayer could only be three words, praise the Lord, and then he had to pass the ammunition. Well, when Frank Lesser heard that story come back, true story from Pearl Harbor, he wrote the song. And people in the Navy loved him for writing for it. He exaggerates a little bit. The lyrics you're going to sing have the chaplain taking over one of the guns and shooting down some enemy planes. Lieutenant Forgey didn't do that. But after the war, he survived the attack on Pearl Harbor. He got to meet Frank Lesser and was thankful that his story was put into this song.
songs here I've been concentrating on World War II. I think uh, given the audience that I'm with, that's probably an appropriate thing to do. There are, I think, approximately 9 million veterans that are over 65 years of age in this country right now. So there's still a very large group remaining from the 16 million Americans who served during World War II. Our final song from the end of World War II I was always puzzled by this song, Sentimental Journey. If you look in the middle underneath it, do you recognize the name Les Brown? Yeah. Finish this phrase for me, Les Brown and... That's how familiar you were with them. I can tell you were familiar with them. I wondered because I said, well, they wrote the song at the end of the war in 1944, just before the war was starting to wind down. And I said, how could anybody take a train home from the sands of Africa? How could anybody take a train home from England? How could anybody take a train home from the China Theater or the South Pacific? I mean, I'm only mentioning some of the theaters of war. So I said, that makes no sense to me. And then I read the story of how the song came to be. Les Brown and the boys in the band were back here. They were in the United States. They had been a band that traveled a lot with Bob Hope doing USO performances during World War II. But they were back here in the States and they were taking a train from a Midwestern city to another Midwestern city for their next dance band engagement back here. And in the particular, the name on the left there, Bud Green, was sitting opposite a young woman on that train. And the young woman was reading a book. The title of the book was Sentimental Journey. I've never read it, but she was reading it and Bud Green was bored. If you're a songwriter and you're bored and you don't have a book to read, what do you do? To write a song. And he wrote it. Now, the truth of the song came a year later when our ships were bringing our uh, veterans home, men and women, into the ports of the East and the West Coast. You may remember that in the mid-1940s, we didn't have commercial aircraft developed as mightily as it is now. That was actually a spin-off of World War II. All those nifty planes that were made got converted to be passenger airplanes. But that's another story. But when you got dropped off in the ports of New York City, how was somebody in Iowa going to get home in 1945 by train? So this song became one of the very hopeful end of war songs. Go take a sentimental journey. Go set my heart at ease. Go make a sentimental
As we move to the final segment of the program, I don't want you to think that by only putting two more songs in to represent the time from World War II until now, that I'm giving any sense of short shrift to veterans and their service. What I am giving a sense to is the way that music changed during times of conflict after World War II. It was a simple fact that during the Korean conflict, people here were caught up with something called rock and roll. Some fellow by the name of Elvis Presley was wiggling his hips around while people were serving in the Korean conflict, you see. So attention to music changed forever after World War II. It didn't disappear totally. We did hear a few patriotic songs during the Korean conflict, but during the Vietnam conflict, the songs were converted in many instances to be protest songs. And in the modern era, I'm not gonna ask the question because I know the answer. You know that as we sit here this morning, we are officially at war. Do you hear any patriotic songs on the radio? No. Do you hear any songs being crafted during the time of the Afghanistan conflict or the Iraqi conflict or the Persian conflicts, Persian Gulf conflicts of the night? No. So I'm not saying that the service of veterans from 1945 until now has diminished in its importance in any way. What I am saying is music in connection with veterans and their service has changed profoundly. Mm -hmm. We got a few songs along the way. I'm going to give you two. Number 21, I Believe, was a very popular song. Frankie Lane had a big hit with this song, but it actually goes to a specific singer whose name was Jane Froman. During the time of the Korean conflict, Jane Froman got a letter from a GI who was serving in Korea. And her program called the USA Canteen Show was broadcast to their base in Korea. He wrote her a letter, he said, Ms. Froman, I just want to tell you how much we look forward to hearing your program broadcast at our base when we can have the chance to hear it. She was so moved by the letter, she said to her songwriting team, these four fellows whose names are there, write me a song that's especially hopeful. And on her next program, she sang it, dedicated it to the GI. He heard that. He survived the Korean conflict. He came home and he got to meet Jane Froman. So the song became very popular here. A lot of people knew this song well, I believe. They didn't know of its connection to the Korean conflict. Think of it this way. If that GI doesn't take the time to write the note to Jane Froman, you and I never get to sing this. I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower I believe that somewhere in the darkest night a candle glows. I believe for everyone who goes astray, someone will come to show the way. I believe, I believe, I believe above the storm the smallest gray will still be I believe that somewhere in the great somewhere is every word. Every time I hear a newborn baby cry or touch a leaf or see the sky, then I know why I believe. During the Vietnam conflict, we began a new concept called special divisions of the forces. Those of you who are military probably keep up with this. During the Vietnam conflict, one famous group were called the Green Berets. So just to let you know, some songs have still been crafted. They didn't become as popular as the Army, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, and Marine songs, but they're there, and I just thought I'd do this one for you. Um, Barry Sadler, who was a sergeant during the Vietnam conflict, lost one of his limbs and he came back and as he was being treated for his medical issues, he wrote this song because he was so missing his buddies from his group of Green Berets, his special forces buddies that were still back there. So he wrote a song to honor them. It was in 1966. It's called Ballad of the Green Berets. Fighting soldiers from the sky, fearless men who. Just
stoppen daar. Men who mean just what they say. The brave men of the Green Beret. Silver wings upon their chests. These are men, America's best. One hundred men will test today. But only three in the Green Beret put silver wings on my son's chest. Make him one of America's best. Be a man, they'll test one day. Have him win the Green Beret. So right now, I have a godson who's serving somewhere. He's in the Special Forces. We're very proud of him, those of us who know him. But even his mother and father do not know where he is in the world. Now, I want to make you feel a little bit better. And for some of you veterans, you're going to say, that wasn't fair. We didn't have that. Um, you, I hope you know that this godson of mine, who's somewhere in the world with the Special Forces right now, can Skype with his mother and father. And if you don't know what that word means, it means he can sit in front of a computer screen wherever he is. And his mom and dad can sit in front of the computer screen at home, and they can talk to each other. And he doesn't get to do it often. But boy, are his mom and dad glad that they can Skype with their kid. Now, what is he doing? He can't tell us what he does. But I know some examples of the kinds of things he does. He's trained specially in underwater tactics. He will go off of a US vessel, usually out of a submarine, with a little craft, and he'll travel several miles underwater with a Kevlar uniform on that can't be detected by radar. He will swim underneath an enemy ship somewhere in the world and plant a high-tech listening device <coughs> on the bottom of that ship, turn around, and swim back to his submarine and get in. There's about a 98% chance that he won't be detected while he's doing it. Our technologies have changed a little bit since the time when you served. So he does other things. There are other versions of his buddies who jump out of airplanes and go into some very scary places where we, meaning the American people, don't even know that we have soldiers in the scary places. So don't you think for a minute that before we went over to pay attention to that gentleman, well, I'm sorry I used that term, but to pay atten attention to the gentleman Osama bin Laden in the way that we did, don't you think for a minute that sometime, a month or two or a day or a week before then, a special forces person wasn't standing within eyesight of that house? He may have been camouflaged, hiding behind a bush. I don't know what kind of vegetables they grow over there, but maybe it was all the place. But we do some pretty amazing things in the modern era. I want to finish the program returning to the same concept that I put forth at the beginning. Um, and, and this is the way I like to explain it. I used at the beginning the term veterans and freedom. And I told you I'm always going to say veterans are the defenders of our freedoms. And I like to end the program this way with the song America the Beautiful. And it's my way of paying honor and saying thank you to you veterans, because when I leave here today, think about this when you leave here today. I can get in my car, and I can drive anywhere I want in the United States of America. No one is going to stop me from doing that. What will I see? Some of what I'll see are contained in the lyrics of this beautiful Catherine Lee Bates a song, Oh Beautiful for Spacious Skies amber waves of grain. But I can do that. What do you think a Syrian citizen would give to have that capability to do that in the country of Syria today? What do you think? That's the way I like to think about veterans. Without veterans in their service, we can't do what we did yesterday when we went to the polls. We can't drive our car necessarily from here to California Tomorrow, if you want to take a cross-country trip, I'm in if you want to go. <laughs> oh, beautiful, for oh, spacious skies, for oh, amber waves of grain, for oh, purple mountains, majesties, above the fruit and grain, America, America, God shed his grace on
Our thanks to everyone for joining us this morning. Jack, thank you so very much. We look forward to your return with us again. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh.